Welcome to Political Science 201. I'm Laura Fleming and this is Lecture 11. I'd like to start with a little thought question. Uh, what is your impression of the court system, either from personal experience or from uh, TV and movies? If you click this link here, uh, it'll take you to one of the great classic films uh, about the American um, court system, and I'm referring, of course, to my cousin Vinny. Okay, so uh, if you look at um, TV portrayals of courtroom drama or, or courtrooms in the movies, it all seems very exciting. There's an element of surprise. Um, it's uh, very fast-paced. Uh, but if you've been to court in person, you know that the reality is, is very different. Okay, so uh, courts involve a lot of process and procedure and waiting in lines and, and a lot of behind-the-scenes paperwork. Uh, not nearly as uh, exciting uh, as the uh, TV shows and movies would lead you to believe. Okay, so when if you're an attorney yourself... Uh, you'll find out that, you know, actually being in the courtroom, uh, cross-examining a witness or making your argument uh, to a judge, uh, those are all very exciting points, but it's just a minuscule uh, portion uh, of your time in dealing with the court system. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the American court system today, uh, and especially our federal courts as set up by uh, the Constitution. So we're going to talk about the federal judiciary. Judiciary is just a fancy word for the federal court system. Uh, we're going to talk in, in general about how courts work in the checks and balances and hierarchy within the court system. We're going to talk about the uh, Supreme Court, which is the most visible feature of our federal court system. And then we'll also talk about uh, the lower federal courts, specifically the courts of appeals, uh, and how do you get a case to the Supreme Court. So we'll talk through that. Uh, finally, uh, we'll discuss the balance of power between the three branches of government. You remember earlier in the course, we talked about the legislative branch, Congress, and how Congress makes laws. We talked about the uh, executive branch, the presidency that's responsible for enforcing the laws and also the uh, large bureaucracy attached to the executive branch. Um, and so today we're going to finish up uh, the three branches of government, really the focus of our U.S. Constitution uh, on these three branches, and that is the judiciary or uh, the court system. Okay, we've discussed this at length. Our founders were maniacal about separation of powers. Uh, the legislative branch is discussed in Article I of the Constitution. The founders viewed Congress as the most important uh, branch of government, spent a lot of time uh, discussing how Congress is supposed to be set up. And then we talked about the executive branch, the president, I uh, discussed in Article 2 of the Constitution, and now we turn to uh, Article 3 of the Constitution, the uh, judicial branch responsible for uh, interpreting and applying the laws in individual cases. So the term judicial branch or judiciary just refers to the court system. Courts are made up of a judge and sometimes a jury. And what courts do is they decide cases. That sounds like a throwaway line to decide cases. It's actually very important. What this means is that uh, before a court can do anything, you have to have a problem. You have to have a case. You have to have a, a dispute. Um, you have to bring your problem to the court uh, before the court can act on it. Uh, let's say uh, you have a judge, and let's say the judge um, is heavily pro-life, okay, and this judge is looking for an opportunity uh, to uh, restrict abortion. Um, if 
no case ever walks into her courtroom about abortion, uh, this judge can go her whole life and never have the opportunity to uh, act on uh, her personal beliefs. Okay, so uh, the judge is kind of captive to whatever cases walk into her courtroom. And even if she finds a certain issue very compelling, wants to do something about it, uh, if she never gets a dispute or a case about that issue, uh, she'll never have the opportunity. This is different from someone uh, in Congress, for example. If you have a person in Congress and they have an issue that's very important to them, they can initiate, take action, draft up a bill, uh, try and get support, try to push it through. Okay, courts can't do that. All they can do is apply the law to specific disputes uh, that come into their courtroom. And usually you don't have uh, control over what kinds of cases come into your courtroom. So rather than create laws, the court applies the laws to a specific situation. Uh, and we need this because uh, the devil is in the details. Okay, so you can have a law and there can be a lot of questions how to apply that law in individual circumstances because uh, people uh, get themselves into all kinds of uh, shenanigans and disagreements and, and sometimes it can be very confusing how to apply the law in a particular case uh, that's when the court comes in two basic types of cases okay the first type is called a criminal case there are some behaviors uh, that our society finds so heinous that we have made criminal laws against those behaviors. So we have criminal laws against murder, uh, against robbery, etc. So in a criminal case, uh, the government prosecutes a defendant accused of a crime. So you have a prosecutor that works for the government acting on behalf of the people and, and whatever uh, this person has um, allegedly done is so heinous that we have a criminal law uh, against it. And if convicted, uh, the defendant may go to prison. Okay, so we have criminal laws against uh, bad behavior. Uh, and these are so important that the government will prosecute these laws on behalf of the people. And uh, the defendant, if convicted, could lose their precious freedom and you can also have criminal laws that impose uh, fines uh, if it's a really horrific crime you could even lose your life okay those would be uh, capital crimes crimes where uh, capital punishment is imposed then you have some called a civil case uh, in a civil case the government does not normally get involved it's a dispute between two parties one party called the plaintiff and you can remember that word because it has uh, that root um, plaint it's the same as complaint uh, so the plaintiff has a complaint they sue another party uh, the defendant again in both civil and criminal cases the person on the hot seat is called the defendant they're playing defense uh, so one party the plaintiff sues another party for money okay um, so uh, criminal cases can be about uh, freedom, going to prison, right? Justice for victims. Uh, civil cases most of the time uh, have to do with money. So we do have uh, civil laws uh, that provide in certain cases um, that we think certain activities could be damaging. And if you can prove damages, then the person who committed uh, that offense has to pay money. Uh, but we feel like these disputes over money are not important enough for the government to get involved. So uh, if you feel that you've been aggrieved uh, in this way, then you can bring a lawsuit and you can try to prove your case. Um, here's uh, one example. Um, I work in the area of employment law, so I deal with sex harassment cases. Okay, certain types of sexual offenses are criminal for example rape different kinds of sexual assault those are um, serious enough that we have criminal laws against them and the person who commits uh, those crimes could potentially go to jail uh, we also have civil sex harassment laws uh, and those are laws 
uh, prohibiting harassment in the workplace, for example, uh, to the level that's not serious enough to be a crime, uh, but serious enough that the law recognizes if you feel that you've been damaged by sex harassment in the workplace that you can file a lawsuit and try to get uh, money to compensate you for your damages. Okay, there is a hierarchy of courts to promote stability. Uh, so the, the judges can't just apply the law however they want to, all right? So the idea is that we want uniformity, uh, we want stability in how the laws are applied. We don't want people running around trying to get a judge who's going to do them uh, special favors in application of the law. So for this reason, there's rules, there's a hierarchy, uh, and courts generally have multiple levels. Let's talk about the bottom level. A case generally starts out in trial court. Okay, that's the bottom level. The trial court's decision can then be appealed to a higher court. When you appeal, you're basically saying, um, I don't like your decision, judge, and I want to talk to your manager. Okay, so you can appeal the trial court's decision to the higher court. Now, um, higher courts uh, will often publish their decisions as case law. Okay, this is very interesting. Courts uh, cannot um, write laws the same way that a legislature can. Okay, so they can't. Um, create laws out of nothing. Uh, however, uh, they do publish a kind of law called case law, uh, and in it, what case law does is it's a record of how the law is applied in a specific situation. Um, and so uh, in these um, case law reports, what you'll see is you'll see the judge, and the judge says, you know, okay, these are the facts of the case, uh, this is the law that's been passed by the legislature or the regulation that's been passed by an administrative agency. And, and the court says, uh, this is how I applied the law in this particular set of facts, uh, and this is my reason for doing that. Okay, so um, why do these courts publish their decisions? Um, the reason they do that is because the lower courts are bound to follow the case law of the higher courts. Uh, this is called following precedent. Okay, so a trial court, again, can't just decide cases the way they think is best. Uh, they have to be uh, familiar with the case law, uh, and they have to be familiar with certain patterns in the case law, and they have to follow the case law of the higher courts. That's called um, precedent. So what happens is, is that um, this is why lawyers have to do legal research, all right? So what you do is you uh, go to the case law and you try to find cases decided by higher courts in the past uh, that are similar to your facts and that go the way uh, that you want, okay? And then you bring those cases, those that case law, to the attention of the judge. And you say, hey, judge, the case law is in my favor. Uh, I have these uh, different cases that are uh, similar to mine in facts, and look what happened. The higher court uh, decided in favor of the person that's in the same position as my client, and for this reason, you need to decide in my client's favor. Uh, there's a lot of case law, and it uh, comes out uh, all the time. All judges across the nation are making decisions, uh, churning out case law. Uh, this is a picture uh, from the stacks of a law library. Okay, so uh, you can see um, the, the, the case law goes on forever, uh, right? Fortunately, today we have uh, legally searchable databases. So we have services like Westlaw and Lexis and uh, even uh, Google does a pretty good job for legal research, so I will often just use um, Google. A lot of case law is um, kept for free uh, online these days by different government agencies. Uh, when I was in law school, uh, they did have electronically searchable databases, thank God, but 
uh, the legal research professor, I guess she wanted to torture us or something. So she made us learn how to do legal research manually in uh, the stacks. Uh, so basically what would happen is there would be an index. And so you would go to the index and you would look up uh, key terms that you were interested in. And it would tell you, go look at this volume and this page. And then you have to go and physically find the actual volume that you wanted, physically open it uh, to that particular page. I know that sounds barbaric. Uh, and then you would look and read uh, the case law and, you know, nine times out of 10, uh, it would not be what you wanted. So then you'd have to go back to the index and start all over again. Um, not only that, uh, the index and the case law uh, in hard copy got out of date pretty quickly because again, judges are issuing new case law all the time. So the way they solved this problem was by uh, pocket parts. Uh, so they would uh, get uh, updates to the bound volumes that were usually on newspaper print, you know, kind of um, disposable inserts. Uh, and the law librarian would have her little cart uh, with all of these uh, inserts that we call pocket parts. And each of these hardback bound volumes had a little pocket in the back cover. Uh, and the librarian would go around changing out the pocket parts, putting in the new pocket parts. And the pocket parts would contain the updates uh, until uh, perhaps once a year, the publishing company could come out with the new hardbound volume. So not only did you have to look at the index, you also had to look at the uh, index to the pocket parts and then track down the pocket parts uh, that had the most up-to-date case law. So this was a um, very labor-intensive process, and thank God today they have electronically uh, searchable databases. So the question is, um, can higher courts change their own case law? The answer is yes, a higher court can change its own case law, uh, but there's a strong preference to stand on prior decisions. They don't want to change uh, prior decisions unnecessarily. Uh, so even if a judge um, might not have personally decided a case uh, in a certain way, uh, if that's how the judge's predecessors uh, did it in the past, there's a strong preference to stand on prior decisions to not change case law, even though a higher court technically can change its own case law. Uh, so this principle is called stare decisis. It means to stand by what's already been decided. So sometimes a higher court uh, will change its mind if, you know, five or ten years has gone by and a case was clearly decided wrongly. Uh, then the new judge may uh, overturn it. Uh, but many times uh, the judge is going to let the older case stay out of respect for the stability of the law. So let's um, give an example. Let's say you have a, a civil case involving alleged sex harassment. So let's say you have a young woman employee and she says that her boss sexually harassed her. She says that he had uh, bikini pictures on his computer screensaver, which she found offensive. Uh, she says that he called her sweetheart on a number of occasions, which she did not appreciate. And worst of all, one day when she was walking down um, the hallway at work, uh, this boss smacked her in the rear end with a file folder. And she believes that uh, this constitutes sex harassment, and she's suing for money because she believes she's been damaged by that. So um, both the young woman and the supervisor will have attorneys. Uh, and these attorneys will go uh, and look through the case law and try to find other decisions involving sex harassment. Okay, so the law says uh, that uh, sex harassment has to be severe or pervasive uh, before uh, you can file a lawsuit and get money for your damages. So the question is, you know, what is severe or pervasive? Uh, if somebody uh, happens to tell kind of an edgy joke uh, at work, does that by itself uh, constitute 
um, sex harassment so that you can get money if you've been offended by that joke, uh, how much bad behavior constitutes uh, actual uh, sex harassment. So the attorney uh, for the manager will look for cases where the facts were worse, but the judge still said, no, that doesn't quite rise to the level of actionable sex harassment. And um, the attorney for the young woman is going to do lots of research in the case law, try to find cases where the facts uh, were actually not as severe as in her case, uh, but the judge did find uh, actionable sexual harassment. So you can see uh, how that works, how legal research is very important. Um, some questions are pretty uh, easy to find the answer through legal research, very clear cut. Uh, but other questions like, you know, when does uh, boorish and rude behavior in the workplace rise to the level of um, prohibited sexual harassment? You know, that's kind of a gray area. Uh, and there are cases in the case law that you can use to argue uh, both ways. So again, uh, the lawyers will uh, study the case law of these higher courts to try to persuade the judges in their favor. So most courts, uh, and this is true, you know, with our, our federal courts, um, state courts, which we'll talk about later, even in uh, other countries, most of the time your courts are going to have three levels. The bottom level is the uh, trial court, Okay, and the middle level is the appeals court. So if um, you don't like what happens to you at the trial court level, uh, you can appeal to that middle layer, the appeals court. Uh, finally, uh, if you don't like what happens to you at the appeals court, you generally have one more level, uh, which is the Supreme Court. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about juries. Okay, so... Um, you're only going to find the jury in the trial court layer. So if you think about a jury to help you remember this, okay, think about the jury as the fruits and the nuts. And if you have this nice layer cake, uh, the fruits and the nuts uh, sink down to the bottom level. Okay, so that's going to be the trial court level. Let's talk about juries for a minute. Uh, in general, only the trial court uses a jury. Uh, a jury is... Uh, a group of lay persons that they um, pull into the courthouse to help decide these cases. And because the jury is made up of lay people, not attorneys, uh, they're bound to follow the law as instructed by the judge. Okay, so the jury's job is not to determine uh, what the law is. Uh, the judge will tell uh, the jury uh, what the law is. So, for example, in our sex harassment case, the judge uh, might say, okay, you know, it's not um, prohibited sexual harassment unless uh, the actions are severe and pervasive, okay? So, the job of the judge is to decide the law. The judge is going to have a lot of training in the law. What does a jury do? Uh, the job of the jury is to decide the facts, decide who they believe. Okay, if the facts are not under dispute, the judge can decide the case without a jury. Uh, going on, the higher courts uh, only decide the law. If the facts are in dispute, they will send the case back to the trial court for a jury to consider. Uh, this is why there's no jury in those higher layers of the cake uh, because the higher layers of the cake, they uh, dwell in kind of this ivory tower. They only decide the law. Uh, they don't decide the facts. Okay, so um, you don't have to understand the law to know who you believe and who you don't believe, to look a witness in the eye and to assess credibility. Uh, so, for example, let's take up our harassment case again. Judge decides the law, uh, but let's say uh, that the supervisor uh, denies the charges by the young lady. Let's say that he says, I do not have uh, bikini pictures on my computer. In fact, I have one of those uh, 
filtering software to make sure that I never have anything inappropriate on my computer. Uh, moreover, uh, I would never call anyone sweetheart other than my wife. Uh, and finally, I, I would never hit anyone in the rear end with a file folder if something like that did happen. Uh, it would have been a complete and total inadvertent accident. Okay, so you have the testimony of the supervisor, uh, the testimony of the young lady, and the jury would have to decide who do they believe. Do they think the uh, supervisor is telling the truth? Do they think the young lady is telling the truth? They'll listen to the uh, young lady's friends. Maybe they support her. They'll uh, look at the computer records or the videotape. Maybe that supports the supervisor. Uh, so uh, that is what the jury does. The jury decides who they believe. And um, again, if nobody disputes what happened, many times the case can be decided by the judge without a jury. Okay, now we're going to segue into um, our national court system. We're going to look at Federalist SA 78. This starts on page 69 of your accessible Federalist. So I encourage you guys to read uh, Federalist SA 78 by Hamilton. It's very interesting. So one of the um, purposes of this essay is to explain uh, one of the reasons why judges are different from members of Congress. And uh, one of the biggest differences under the federal court system is that uh, members of Congress are elected for a specific term, uh, but judges are not elected in the federal court system. They're appointed by the president, number one. Okay, so judges are not elected by the people. They're appointed by the president. And number two, uh, they're not elected for a specific term. Instead, uh, judges hold their offices during good behavior, which means as long as they behave themselves, they can remain judges for life. Now, um, that's uh, quite a bit of power given to a judge that, number one, they're not answerable to the people, and number two, they don't have terms. They serve for life. Uh, so how does Hamilton justify that? Uh, his his first point is he says um, the judiciary will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution. So he has this idea uh, that judges uh, are not as susceptible to abuse of power uh, as legislators and the president. The reason for this, he says, is that uh, the president, the executive, not only distributes honors, but holds the sword of the community. So the, the executive branch has a lot of power because they have the power of enforcement. Congress also has a lot of power. They control the budget. They make the rules by which the duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated. He says the um, judiciary, on the other hand, has no influence over either the sword or the purse. No direction either of the strength or the wealth of society and can initiate no action whatsoever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment and must depend upon the cooperation of the executive, even for the enforcement of its judgments. Um, so Hamilton says, you know, the judiciary is um, passive because, again, they can only react to whatever cases are brought in front of them. They don't make the rules. That's the job of the legislature. And they can't even enforce their own judgments. They have to rely on uh, the police, the executive branch, to enforce their judgments. So Hamilton says the judiciary is by far the weakest of the three departments of power. Um, for this reason, he says, and we'll talk about that, I, I think that this is one area where uh, the founders did not anticipate the power of the modern Supreme Court and the modern judiciary. Okay, we'll talk about that. But the founders uh, felt that um, because 
Uh, the court system is inherently reactive and passive because they have to rely on Congress to pass the laws and the executive branch to enforce the laws that the um, court system was weak. They weren't going to threaten uh, the liberty of the people. Uh, and for this reason, they felt comfortable giving life tenure uh, to judges. Not only that, uh, Hamilton says um, these judges have a very important duty. Their duty is to declare all acts contrary to the clear meaning of the Constitution void. Uh, so these judges, their main job would be to stand up for the Constitution if the um, executive branch or the legislative branch overstepped their bounds and created laws or took other action against the Constitution, uh, judges were responsible for standing up to that. And Hamilton says nothing can contribute to the decisiveness and independence of the judiciary as a permanent appointment to office. So in other words, if the judges know that they're in office for as long as they want to be there, right, until they retire or, or God forbid, pass away in office, uh, there's nothing that the legislature or the president can do for them as long as they have good behavior. Um, so this will give them the backbone and the courage to stand up. Um, Hamilton uh, goes on and he says, you know, this, this is important. He says that this conclusion, the conclusion that the judges have to stand up for the Constitution, that they have the ability to strike down acts of the legislator, acts of the president, this conclusion does not in any way suppose judicial power is superior to the legislative. It only supposes that the power of the people is superior to both. He says this does not mean that judges are more important or somehow above uh, Congress, uh, it just means that the people, as their will is expressed in the Constitution, are above both the court system and the legislature. If the will of the legislature, as expressed in its statute, stands in opposition to the will of the people, as expressed in the Constitution, the judges ought to follow the Constitution. They ought to regulate their decisions by fundamental laws i.e. the Constitution, rather than those laws that are not fundamental, i.e. laws passed by Congress. Courts of justice are to be considered the bulwarks of a limited Constitution against legislative overreach. And this again provides a strong argument for the life tenure of judicial offices. So he says um, we, we have to have a strong, secure court system to be able to stand up for the Constitution against uh, Congress and the President when they get too greedy. Then he goes on, he says there's uh, another reason why uh, it's important for judges to be appointed uh, for life. And he says, um, it's been frequently and correctly said a lengthy code of laws is one of the inconveniences necessarily connected with the advantages of a free government. So he says, uh, when you have a government of the people, uh, you're also of necessity going to have a lot of laws. If you have a dictatorship, um, you don't need a lot of laws because the dictator is the law, right? Whatever the dictator says goes. But when you have a free country, you're going to have a lot of laws. In order to avoid an arbitrary discretion in the courts, it's indispensable. They should be limited by strict rules and precedents. So he says uh, we have all these laws. Uh, in addition, uh, we have strict precedent. Okay, I showed you what the law library uh, looks like. Uh, we have to have a system of order and hierarchy where the higher courts uh, write down their decisions and the lower courts find them. Hamilton goes on, it's easy to see from the variety of disputes which grow out of the foolishness and wickedness of mankind. Uh, I like that phrase. He says that, you know, 
people are foolish, people are evil, people are going to get themselves in all kinds of messes, so courts will never have any shortage of cases. Therefore, the number of these cases is going to unavoidably grow very large and demand long and careful study to obtain a competent knowledge of them. So he says, um, we're going to get a lot of cases and the case law is going to swell uh, and it's going to take a lot of time and effort and energy to be familiar with the case law. He says, this is why there can be only a few men in society who will have enough skill in the law to qualify them as judges. So judges have a particular area of expertise that takes a long time to acquire. He says, once we take into account the ordinary depravity of human nature, not to mention the depravity of lawyers, right? Uh, he says, the number of people who combine knowledge with integrity will be even smaller okay so if you want to have a judge you have to have someone that's familiar with the case law is a skilled attorney and also a person of integrity and morals uh, there's not going to be very many of those people what are they going to be doing they'll have a profitable legal practice hamilton says those few qualified individuals will be discouraged from quitting a profitable legal practice to accept a judicial appointment if it would only be for a temporary term. So in other words, um, the few qualified uh, moral attorneys um, would not be interested in becoming a judge if it meant that they have to wind down their legal practice and that takes a while. They have to wind that down uh, and then only be a judge for uh, a short term uh, and then they would I have to come back out and start their legal practice all over again. That's not uh, worth it for an attorney. So Hamilton says uh, we need to have uh, life tenure for judges so that we attract uh, only the most qualified candidates. So we finally get to Article 3 of the Constitution, which creates that third branch of government, the judicial system. Article 3, which you can read starting page 105 in your Accessible Federalist, says the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So Article 3 of the Constitution creates the Supreme Court, and we'll talk about the quote-unquote inferior courts, the lower courts, as well. Article 3 goes on and says, uh, These judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior, i.e. for life. Um, why do members of the Supreme Court serve for life? This is a review of what we talked about uh, with respect to Federalist S-878, life tenure, helps judges remain independent and impartial. They need to have a backbone of steel to stand up when the other branches of government are threatening our freedoms under the Constitution. Uh, and in addition, as we discussed, life tenure is necessary to attract qualified candidates uh, because we are a nation of laws and having uh, familiarity with those laws, especially the Growing case law requires a certain level of uh, legal proficiency. There are nine justices on the Supreme Court. Um, there's nothing in the Constitution that says there have to be nine, uh, but tradition, by tradition, we have uh, nine justices. And each of these justices was uh, appointed by uh, a president. So in the back, we're going from left to right here. Uh, you have, I'll circle them, you have Justice uh, Gorsuch. He was appointed by President Trump. Justice Sotomayor, she was appointed by Obama. Also, uh, Justice Elena Kagan, she was also appointed by Obama. Uh, here you have Justice Kavanaugh, uh, also appointed by Trump. So those are the four most recently appointed uh, justices. In the front here, you have Breyer appointed by Clinton, Thomas appointed by George Bush uh, the first, George Herbert Walker Bush, 
Here you have Roberts appointed by the second George Bush, uh, Ginsburg appointed by Clinton, uh, and Alito appointed by George Bush the second. So um, Gorsuch was appointed to replace Justice uh, Scalia, who was actually a Reagan appointee, okay? And uh, Kavanaugh uh, was appointed to replace Justice Kennedy, who was also a Reagan appointee. So you can see uh, what life tenure means here, uh, that the uh, Supreme Court justice can be very influential long after uh, the president has come and gone. Uh, if you click on this link, you can see little bios of the different justices, including their ages. So um, Justice uh, Gorsuch is the youngest. Uh, he perhaps is of a similar age to your parents. Uh, and Justice uh, Ginsburg is uh, the oldest, um, well into her 80s. Okay, so this is, again, what life tenure means. So the Supreme Court decides cases by majority vote. And this written majority opinion becomes case law, which the lower courts then must follow. A majority vote uh, means that you have to convince at least uh, five of the nine justices that your side is in the right. Okay. Now, um, justices who disagree with the majority have the option of writing what's called a dissent. Okay, these are all um, very well respected legal scholars and they have very strong opinions. So uh, quite often uh, you'll have um, up to four justices who disagree with the majority opinion. Uh, so they're going to write uh, their opinion and why they think the majority is incorrect. Um, this dissent is really just a historical footnote, okay? So the dissent does not have any binding power on the lower courts. The lower courts are bound to follow only the majority opinion. By writing a dissent, uh, justices who disagree with the majority are hoping that at some point down the road um, that uh, their point of view will become the majority and perhaps this case law will get overturned. Okay, so uh, the dissent is kind of like a, a road map for uh, people who might want to try to overturn uh, a certain case going into the future, uh, but it has no binding power like the majority opinion does. Justices may also do something called concur. Uh, this means that they agree with the majority's result, but they want to write their own opinion. Okay, again, you have a lot of very strong legal personalities. They may agree with the majority, but they have something else that they want to say, so they'll write a, a concurrence. So as you can imagine, between the majority opinion, the dissent, uh, perhaps multiple dissents and multiple concurrences, uh, these Supreme Court opinions can get uh, quite lengthy. And you can go on the Supreme Court website, and if you browse through it, you can see recent Supreme Court opinions and take a look um, just at how lengthy they can be. Uh, Justice Scalia passed away, um, I guess it was four years ago now. Time goes by uh, quickly. Um, you are welcome to click on this link here uh, and listen to a description of his life. Very interesting um, judge. So he was one of the three most conservative justices on the Supreme Court, uh, and he was very influential. He was known for his scathing dissent, so many times he was not in the majority. Uh, also, his uh, emphasis on originalism. Okay, so he uh, wanted the Constitution interpreted uh, as the founders might have originally intended it. Okay, we'll see uh, there's a tension between uh, activist judges who uh, want to reinterpret the Constitution because they feel that the original intent of the founders uh, 
uh, was perhaps insufficient to deal with the challenges that we have in the modern world. Uh, and then you have uh, more conservative justices that practice uh, something called judicial restraint, where they believe that the judges should only um, strike down laws uh, that are unconstitutional and should not be at the forefront of creating public policy. Okay, so we have this tension uh, inherent in the Supreme Court today, and Scalia was on uh, one side. Um, Neil Gorsuch, Trump's first appointment, replaced Justice uh, Scalia. We'll talk about uh, appointments. Um, I think I think what's what's interesting is that right now uh, we're pretty evenly divided uh, between conservative and liberal justices. Let's talk a little bit about political ideology on the Supreme Court. Uh, on the one side, you have the more conservative justices. Uh, today, uh, these justices um, have all been appointed by Republican presidents, but in the past, you did have more crossover. Uh, these more conservative justices, uh, they tend to interpret the Constitution to limit the federal government. They uphold uh, the checks and balances that were put there by the original founders. They're interested in what the uh, founders originally intended in the Constitution, uh, and uh, they uh, tend to be more traditional in their outlook and their interpretation. On the other hand, you have more liberal justices. Uh, these interpret the Constitution generally in favor of federal government action. They have a more expansive view uh, of what government is allowed to do under the Constitution. They have uh, less adherence uh, to traditionalism and to the original ways of looking at government. Okay, They believe that uh, the Constitution is a living document that should evolve with the times. Uh, so if you look, uh, you'll see we have in this, this little um, pictogram was created by the New York Times. So you have these uh, four uh, justices, Kagan, Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Breyer, who are more liberal, okay, more in favor of um, expanding uh, government action. Uh, and then you have the less liberal justices. This would include uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, former Justice Scalia, replaced by Neil Gorsuch. So, um, Neil Gorsuch, um, Sorry, Justice Scalia passed away while President Obama uh, was president. And President Obama uh, had uh, put up um, a, a justice that he thought would be a good replacement for Scalia. This was a, a more liberal justice. Uh, and remember, uh, the Senate has to approve appointments. And so the Senate at the time, the Senate had majority Republican um senators uh, and they said let's hold off on this appointment let's wait and see what happens in the election uh, so if hillary clinton had won the election uh, no doubt we would have had uh, scalia replaced by a more liberal justice instead uh, trump uh, won the election he appointed gorsuch and that was um, fairly uncontroversial because you were really just replacing one conservative justice with another that people suppose Neil Gorsuch was going to be similarly uh, conservative uh, and not super controversial. Now here you have uh, Roberts and especially Justice Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy has been something of a swing vote. Okay, so uh, in tight cases uh, where the decision is 4-5 or 5-4, uh, Justice Kennedy is is often uh, the one uh, who would be making the difference. Okay, the the swing vote. Sometimes he would vote with his uh, more liberal colleagues, and sometimes he would vote with his more conservative colleagues. Okay, when Kennedy retired, uh, this was more controversial because now you were potentially uh, replacing a swing vote uh, with a potentially uh, conservative justice okay so that was very 
controversial uh, in the Senate's in the de in the um, sorry the Democrats in the Senate uh, tried to block uh, Kennedy's replacement, who was Brett Kavanaugh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, that was a very difficult uh, appointment process. Ultimately, Kennedy was replaced by Kavanaugh. Uh, we don't have much of a record of decisions by uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh yet, but we assume uh, that it's going to play out, um, that, that the uh, court is still going to be um, pretty balanced between uh, liberal and conservative. In fact, sometimes Roberts uh, has also been uh, a swing vote, uh, voting with the uh, more liberal justices to create a majority. But you can see how the court is, uh, at this point, uh, very interestingly and carefully balanced. So we'll have to see what happens uh, next. Again, we talked about the fact that uh, Ginsburg is uh, older. And she hasn't been in great health. Uh, that's going to be a very controversial appointment uh, if President Trump uh, remains in office. Uh, because that could uh, potentially change the balance of the Supreme Court so that all of a sudden you would have a clear uh, conservative majority. So a very interesting, very political, uh, this balance of power on the Supreme Court. And again, because Supreme Court justices serve for life, uh, they can have an impact for beyond any individual president. Okay, as we saw, um, Article 3 of the Constitution also creates the lower or inferior courts. Uh, we have 12 regional circuit courts of appeal, and these feed into the Supreme Court. An appeal from one of the circuit courts of appeals may go to the Supreme Court, but um, the Supreme Court does not have to accept cases for review. Um, in fact, they only accept 1% of cases that are appealed to them. If you click on uh, that link, you can see it's the uh, Supreme Court website kind of complaining about their workload. Uh, and if you do the math, you'll see that uh, they only actually hear about 1% of the cases that are appealed to them. And so for the other 99% of cases, you're just out of luck. You're stuck with uh, what the Court of Appeals has uh, decided. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a very uh, interesting situation if somebody says, I'm going to appeal uh, my case all the way to the Supreme Court, you can say, good luck with that. The uh, Supreme Court only hears 1% of cases. And generally, they're going to pick cases um, that have national significance um, and also cases where the circuit courts of appeal uh, have come up with different answers. So for, it's called a circuit split. Uh, if the Ninth Circuit uh, is leaning one direction and the, uh, for example, Fifth Circuit is leaning a different direction, the Supreme Court might pick up a case like that to try and resolve uh, the differences in interpretation. Okay, so Louisiana is part of the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit includes Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Um, Louisiana has trial courts. Remember we talked about the fact that the court system is a three-layer cake. And so basically Louisiana has federal trial courts for the western, middle, and eastern districts. Uh, we are in the um, western district, so if you click on this link here, you can see uh, the closest federal trial courts to us. And um, the closest trial court to uh, Louisiana Tech uh, is in Monroe. So you may ask, you know, in Monroe, I thought we had, you know, courts in Ruston and in Farmerville. We'll talk about those. Those are not federal trial courts, okay? The closest federal trial court uh, for us is going to be in Monroe, Shreveport, Alexandria, uh, etc. Uh, so if you're not happy with what happens to you in the federal trial court, uh, you can appeal to the Fifth Circuit. Um, if you uh, click on this Fifth Circuit website, you'll see the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal is actually located 
uh, in New Orleans, right? So the physical courthouse has to be located somewhere, even though the Fifth Circuit represents cases uh, from Texas and from Mississippi, the courthouse is physically located in New Orleans. So again, here's Louisiana. Uh, you don't like what happens to you in federal trial court, you can appeal to the Fifth Circuit. If you don't like what happens in the Fifth Circuit, um, you can try to appeal to the Supreme Court and good luck with that. So uh, here is our layer cake one more time. Uh, if you have a federal court case, you would start in the federal district court for the Western District of Louisiana. You don't like what happens. You can appeal to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. You don't like what happens. Uh, you can appeal all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, I'd like to give you an example. Okay, you can, there's many, many examples you can come up with. I'd like to give you... Uh, an example of a case and how it proceeded through the federal court system. So in, in 2010, uh, President Obama signed Obamacare into law. Uh, it was a very sweeping uh, example of health care reform. And there were a lot of different provisions in Obamacare, uh, but the bottom line is that uh, individuals had to purchase health care or they would face a penalty. And employers uh, also uh, had to provide health care or they would face a penalty. This health care uh, had to be of a certain type and provide for specific things. Uh, and then if health care was too expensive, we had these exchanges uh, to facilitate uh, subsidies for people that needed to purchase health care. Okay, so it was kind of a um, regulatory framework governing health insurance. And the bottom line is that uh, individuals were forced to buy it uh, or face a penalty and employers were first forced to provide it or face a penalty. So um, some states thought that this was unconstitutional and they filed a lawsuit challenging Obamacare. They did this with the help of an interest group called the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, something like that. You can take a look at their website. Uh, so these 26 states and the NFIB filed a lawsuit. They had to start somewhere, so they picked a trial court uh, in Florida. Okay, so they filed their lawsuit in Florida uh, in a federal court for the Northern District of Florida. And they said, you know, we are calling on the courts to strike down Obamacare as unconstitutional. Uh, now this um, Florida judge uh, being uh, appointed for life uh, had a lot of backbone and struck down the whole thing and said, okay, I'm game for this. I'm going to call out Obamacare, strike it down. I don't think the Constitution allows the national government to force people to buy health care. Uh, now, the Obama administration obviously was not going to let some rogue federal court judge in Florida overturn their signature legislation. So they appealed. Um, where would the Obama administration appeal to? Well, they would appeal to one of the circuit courts. Uh, specifically, the 11th Circuit is a circuit that includes Florida, so they appealed to the 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit was more cautious, and they focused on the least popular portion of Obamacare, and that was the quote-unquote individual mandate, the requirement uh, for individuals to buy health care uh, or face a penalty. Okay, so the 11th Circuit said, we're not going to strike down all of Obamacare. We're just going to strike down this individual mandate. We don't think that the government should be forcing individuals to purchase health insurance. Well, now nobody's happy because the uh, 26 states and the NFIB want the entire uh, piece of legislation struck down, and um, the Obama administration wants the entire uh, Affordable Care Act upheld. Uh, so both sides uh, cross appeal to the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court um, doesn't have to take this case, but they decide to do so because obviously 
uh, it's of national importance. And in fact, uh, this case was expedited before the Supreme Court. So they took it up, came to a decision upholding Obamacare. It was a 5-4 split, so it was very contentious. Uh, it fell along party lines for the most part, except what's really interesting is that uh, Kennedy in this case was not the swing vote. Kennedy voted with the conservatives in saying that Obamacare uh, had overstepped the power of Congress. Uh, but uh, Justice John Roberts, uh, he actually sided with the liberal justices. So he was the swing vote that made the 5-4 um, majority. And Roberts said, well, um, Obamacare is not exactly forcing people to buy health insurance. Uh, what they're doing is they're requiring a penalty uh, or a tax. So basically, we know the government has the power to tax, and all they're doing is just taxing people if they don't purchase health insurance, which is um, a recognized power over the national government. Okay, so that's the way that uh, Justice Roberts uh, justified upholding Obamacare, and he became the swing vote in that contentious 5-4 case. So um, that's just an example of the politics of how a case works its way through the system uh, and the kind of negotiation that goes on behind the scenes and uh, the, what happens to give us these um, majority opinions uh, that may only have uh, five justices in support. Okay, I told you I'd answer the question, what about the courthouse in Ruston or Farmerville? Uh, the state court systems are totally separate. Um, just like we have uh, our national legislature, our Congress in D.C., and our state legislature in Baton Rouge, just like we have our national executive, the president in D.C., and we have our state executive, the governor in Baton Rouge. Uh, we also have our national court system and our state court system. Um, the thing that's a little confusing is that the national court system, at least the lower courts, are spread throughout the country. And, and so they're kind of uh, interleafed with the state court. So you can actually have a, a state court and a federal court across the street from each other. Um, the Louisiana state court system has that familiar three-part hierarchy where you start out uh, in state district court. You start out at the federal court level, uh, then you move to the courts of appeal, and then you move to the Louisiana state Supreme Court, which happens to be in New Orleans, uh, interestingly, along with the courthouse for the Fifth Circuit. So this begs the question, how do you tell what goes to state court and what goes to federal court, which kinds of cases or which kinds of disputes uh, go to federal court. The thing you need to remember is that the federal courts have limited jurisdiction or power. So remember, uh, the Constitution established a national government that was supreme but limited, and the courts are no exception. The courts are uh, limited in their jurisdiction. So federal courts handle cases that arise under the Constitution or under federal law. This is right out of Article 3. It says, The judicial power shall extend to all cases arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. So, if it's a federal constitution uh, dispute or a federal law dispute, it would go to federal court. Um, everything else, if it's a state law dispute, state constitution dispute, it would go to state court. So that kind of makes sense. Federal courts also handle cases between citizens of different states. So this is, this is also uh, in Article 3. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're um, driving down I-20 from Ruston to Dallas, you cross state lines, you're in Texas, you're in an automobile accident, okay? Let's say um, that the other passenger, or the other driver, excuse me, is from Texas, 
believes that your fault files a lawsuit. They're going to file a lawsuit in Texas state court. Uh, since you're a citizen uh, of Louisiana, you're allowed to move that case from Texas state court to federal court. And the question is, um, why might you want to do that? It does not necessarily have to do with convenience. Okay, so if you move the case to federal court, that does not mean you get to move it to federal court in Louisiana. You're probably going to end up in federal court in Texas. Okay, so why would a resident of Louisiana want to move uh, a case from state court in Texas to federal court in Texas? Well, you might think maybe uh, federal law is better. But actually, um, Federal law doesn't usually govern car accidents. Usually a car accident is going to be governed by state law based on where the accident happened. Uh, so um, regardless of whether you're in state court or federal court, if the accident happened in Texas, it's probably going to be governed by Texas law. So the question still remains if the courthouse is in Texas and the law is going to be Texas law, why would you care if it's a federal courthouse or a Texas courthouse? Well, uh, think about how federal court judges uh, are appointed. Okay, so federal court judges are appointed by the president, approved by the Senate for life. State court judges are not. You've probably seen um, ads advertising the fact that state court judges um can be elected by the people for a, a term, okay? And so if you're from out of state, if you're from Louisiana, you'd rather take your chances with a federal court judge elected by the president, uh, even if uh, it's still going to be located in Texas and even if Texas law is going to be applied. Uh, but you're feeling that the federal court judge is going to be more fair to you uh, than a state court judge that has an obligation to his constituents in Texas. Okay, so the, uh, it's possible that um, the uh, Texas resident is going to be represented by an attorney and maybe they donated to the state court judge's election campaign. Right. So uh, you don't want to get involved with local politics in that way if you're being sued. Uh, so you have the option of moving the case to federal court where the federal court judge uh, is potentially um, protected from local politics because he's appointed at the federal level uh, for life. OK, so uh, if you're a citizen of a different state, uh, you do have the option of moving a case from state court to federal court uh, in hopes that the federal court judge is going to be um, less partial, less biased uh, toward the in-state resident. So the bottom line is that most of your common cases are going to be in state court, not federal court, unless it's federal law or unless it's a dispute between uh, uh, an in-state resident and an out-of-state resident. Uh, thus the saying, um, don't make a federal case out of it. Okay, Federal cases are generally a bigger deal uh, than state court cases. If you uh, have a family issue, a divorce or an adoption or probate or a will or traffic ticket or even most uh, crimes, um, it's going to take place in state court uh, only violations of federal law, disputes over federal law, or the federal constitution are going to be in federal court. Okay, let's review uh, the judiciary checks and balances the other branches and vice versa. So the president appoints judges with Senate approval. These judges can declare the actions of the president or Congress unconstitutional. That's their power. And the Senate can block the president's appointments. Uh, if you want to see an example of the Senate uh, trying to block the president's appointments, you can click on this link here. That's some uh, highlights from the uh, Brett Kavanaugh uh, confirmation hearings. And you can see it got uh, very tense. Uh, there was a woman, Christine Blasey Ford, that accused Kavanaugh of uh, sexually assaulting her while she was 
uh, in high school, um, but uh, it was just her word against his, and so the uh, accusations were not proven, and Kavanaugh went on to become Supreme Court Justice. Here's a question. Which of the three branches of government is most democratic, most um, susceptible to influence by the people, and which is the least democratic? Well, um, Congress is going to be the most representative branch of government. We, we talked about this, and in particular, uh, the House of Representatives. House of Representatives uh, has a representative from every district in the nation. It's a very uh, wide-ranging, eclectic group of individuals uh, elected every two years, very sympathetic to the wishes of the people. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Supreme Court is the least uh, democratic branch of government. They're not elected at all. Uh, and basically, it's... Um, nine justices they've all graduated from elite law schools mostly harvard and yale uh, so they're uh, not a representative group uh, in terms of our general population uh, and they are the least democratic branch of government and they do tend to get out of touch which we'll we'll talk about the founders viewed the judiciary as an important check on Congress. We discussed this from Federalist 78. The Supreme Court's duty must be to declare all acts contrary to the clear meaning of the Constitution void. Uh, the founders also felt the Supreme Court was the weakest of the three departments of power and could never threaten liberty. Okay, so they wanted to bolster the Supreme Court to give those judges a backbone of iron to be able to stand up uh, to Congress and the presidency and keep them in their appropriate places. Uh, however, a uh, Supreme Court uh, has uh, felt free to challenge Congress, challenge the, the president uh, quite often. We'll talk about that. Um, this is a graph of... Uh, basically, when the Supreme Court has overturned various laws. It's kind of an interesting trend over the past 100 years. Uh, so uh, in the first half of the 20th century, the, the 1900s, the Supreme Court overturned many new laws regulating business in the progressive era. So what happened is um, you had the progressives come into office. They had all kinds of ideas for a consolidation of government power uh, at the federal level. They want to implement all kinds of new government programs. Uh, and the Supreme Court at the time um, was very uh, conservative. And they said, I don't think that government's supposed to be doing these things under the Constitution. Uh, and they kept... Uh, striking down these laws regulating business, these economic laws that were fairly uh, new. Okay, so the Supreme Court was kind of uh, evaluating, you know, do these laws fit with our Constitution? And many times the Supreme Court would say no. Uh, then you uh, get to the uh, 40s and 50s, you get to the um, tail end of the Great Depression, and the um, Second World War, where Franklin Roosevelt, F FDR, is president, he has lots of ideas, including his uh, New Deal, uh, lots of ideas for government regulation, government programs. He got very angry at the Supreme Court for continuing uh, to strike down his uh, initiatives and similar initiatives at the, at the state level. And there was kind of a showdown between uh, FDR and the Supreme Court. And FDR basically said, look, there's nothing in the Constitution uh, that requires a Supreme Court to be nine people. So um, I, I can go to Congress, call on Congress to open up the Supreme Court, add additional seats, then I can appoint judges to fill those seats, then I'll have the majority, uh, and then it won't matter what these uh, contrary justices, these uh, anti-progress justices think. Um, that was not a very popular um, 
not a very popular idea. People were a little uncomfortable uh, with the president uh, being bold enough to threaten the court, to threaten to pack the court. Um, nonetheless, the uh, Supreme Court did get more flexible. So there was one uh, justice who retired, uh, another justice who kind of got a little more flexible, started allowing some of this New Deal legislation to flow through. Uh, and the Supreme Court was kind of quiet and submissive for uh, a short period of time in the middle of the of the 20th century. Uh, then you see another very interesting phenomenon. OK, so in the first half of the 1900s, uh, the Supreme Court was dragging its heels and striking down new legislation. Uh, then you see a big shift especially in the 60s and 70s. And now the Supreme Court is out ahead of the curve and it's overturning not new laws, but old laws. Okay, so there's many old laws on the books regulating um, social conduct. So laws prohibiting birth control that we'll talk about, laws prohibiting uh, abortion and other forms of sexual behavior and these laws have been around for a long time and the supreme court uh, became uh, activists instead of dragging their heels they're now they're at the cutting edge of social change and they start striking down uh, some of these laws so that uh, also was a a very interesting period um, this tension between uh, the supreme court at the cutting edge at the forefront of change uh, and the legislatures uh, dragging their heels. So the bottom line is the Supreme Court, uh, I would argue, is not a weaker branch of government at all, that they have been uh, quite bold uh, in challenging the other branches from time to time. The Supreme Court has made some serious mistakes. Okay, so uh, we talked about the fact that um, people are not angels. That's why we have government. Our leaders are not angels. That's why we have checks and balances. And we would have to include Supreme Court justices in that group as well. They are not angels. They do make uh, mistakes. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of these. The first one is this uh, Dred Scott decision. Okay, Dred Scott uh, was, a, uh, was a slave. Uh, and at, at the time, this was before the Civil War, we had slave states and free states. And the rule was that if your master uh, voluntarily brought you a slave into a free state, that you could get your freedom. Um, so Dred Scott sued for his freedom. He had a little help. His master had brought him into a free state. Uh, the case went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said no slavery is a basic right protected by the constitution and the constitution does not protect slaves um this was a wrong reading of the constitution this decision was wrong on multiple levels okay obviously it was a morally wrong decision uh, it was also a, a legally wrong decision um, the, the founders actually were very careful that the Constitution was a neutral document. The Constitution uh, was intended, was not intended to protect slavery uh, at all. The Constitution was intended to be uh, neutral and in fact provided that eventually uh, slavery could be constitutionally overthrown. Okay, so this Dred Scott decision uh, was wrong and it actually helped uh, exacerbate the tensions that led up to the Civil War. Uh, here's another one that had to do with segregation. Uh, this was 1896 uh, after the Civil War, after the 14th Amendment that says uh, states must provide equal protection in due process. Uh, at the time, Louisiana had this law requiring black people and white people to travel in separate railroad cars okay so it was um, legally enforced segregation uh, that law was challenged went up to the supreme court uh, supreme court said no um, constitution does not prohibit racial segregation again this was a morally wrong decision we don't want race 
segregation. Uh, it was also legally wrong because the 14th Amendment clearly prohibits laws that treat white people and black people differently. Okay, so legally wrong, morally wrong, took many years uh, for the Supreme Court to correct that decision. I'll give you one more, uh, Korematsu versus United States. Uh, you may know that during World War II, uh, FDR issued an order to round up Japanese Americans and put them in these uh, internment camps. Uh, one of these uh, Japanese Americans uh, filed a lawsuit to the Supreme Court, said we think this violates the 14th Amendment. Supreme Court disagreed, said the Constitution uh, did not protect Japanese Americans from forced relocation during World War II. Again, this decision was morally wrong. It was legally wrong. Of course, uh, the Constitution uh, prohibits rounding up uh, Americans and putting them in camps simply based upon their uh, ethnicity. So um, the Supreme Court was not intended to be the final word on the Constitution. It's supposed to uh, check and balance the other branches, but it was not supposed to be the final word. Uh, the Constitution is supreme over both Congress and the court uh, equally. And there is a, a tradition um, going back, uh, you know, to, to the time of the founders uh, where uh, each branch of government has the right to interpret the Constitution for its own uh, purposes. If you look at um, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson said each department of the federal government is truly independent and has an equal right to decide for itself what is the meaning of the Constitution. Each of the three departments has equally the right to decide for itself what is its duty under the Constitution without regard to what the others may have decided for themselves. So Thomas Jefferson uh, felt that each branch of government, including the Supreme Court, was truly independent and was not intended to be the final word on the Constitution. Um, Andrew Jackson, we talked about him, the first Democrat president. He said the Congress, the executive, and the court must each for itself be guided by its own opinion of the Constitution. Each public officer who takes an oath to support the Constitution swears that he will support it as he understands it and not as it is understood by others. The opinion of the judges has no more authority over Congress than the opinion of Congress has over the judges. And on that point, the president is independent of both. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, he had to deal with that horrible Dred Scott decision. He says, um, the candid citizen must confess if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the Supreme Court the instant they are made. So he says, if we're going to allow the Supreme Court to irrevocably decide public policy just by a majority vote, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having practically resigned their government into the hands of the Supreme Court. Uh, Lincoln was saying, uh, we're not going to resign our government into the hands of the Supreme Court. They should not be the final word. Yes, they have a role in checking and balancing the other branches, but they should not be the final word. Remember, a Supreme Court, uh, not elected, not representative. And the founders believed that it was the people who were to have the ultimate power. you could please prepare for the next lecture. We're going to start talking about the Bill of Rights. That'll be very interesting. Uh, thank you for listening, and I look forward to um, speaking with you again uh, in the next lecture.